All right, guys, welcome back to Southeastern 14. Blake Lovell and Max Barr here to discuss our combo guard rankings for SEC basketball uh, heading into the 23-24 season. If you haven't already, go back, check out our point guard video we did. And I know, Max, as we talked about, this is kind of – so what you've done is you've made a sheet here, and we've kind of listed these players in different categories. And so there may be some people who think, well, this guy should have been mentioned on the point guard ranking, but maybe we have him on our combo guard sheet. Um, so I think that's just worth noting. Yes, we're, we're going to get to all of them um, in terms of the guys that made our rankings. We may not get to every single player, but um, just to note, if you kind of said, well, where was this guy in the point guard rankings? Chances are you're going to hear about him uh, in the combo guard section. But as always, Max, this is a, we say it, I mean, it's a very, you know, guard heavy league in terms of the SEC and all the great talent when it comes to the guards. Uh, and again, this kind of group here, we're looking at with the combo guards, Guys, you can just do a little bit of everything. And, you know, we've kind of put together our, our lists here in terms of the rankings, as I always say. You're much better at actually ranking them um, seven to one than I am. I just kind of go all over the place with them sometimes. But um, this should be an interesting discussion, just looking at all of these great um, talents in this league, because this is a very deep group when we start to talk about this combo guard group. Yeah, I think this is the deepest position group. Um, there, I mean, this is a hard group to rank. This is hard. There's <laughs> yeah. only a few there's only like a few teams that don't have like a bona fide stud at, at, at a combo guard position here. So bear with us, the rankings. I mean, my rankings, I, I it was supposed to be a top five ended up being, right. like top five, top eight. it's just, I got eight on my list. So it's like, yeah, you know, yeah. But. So there's, this is a loaded, loaded position group. Um, and I think that's one reason why the SEC is going to really take a jump this year. We had a lot of good combo guard transfers come in, not a lot left. A lot of the best ones last year are still here. So, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be interesting. Um, do you want to just jump right in here? Yeah. So, all right, let's let's start with your because, again, you're better at starting this off because I think that leads into a, a good discussion. So you have seven on your list. Yeah. Like I said, I, I my short list has eight. I my ranking probably is not very clear. I think I know who I would have as number one um, and number two. Beyond that, I think there's a lot of room for movement. And I'm curious to see kind of how you have them ranked. But. We'll start with your number seven to kind of see where, where this ranking starts for you. All right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I couldn't wait to jump into this, by the way. So, <laughs> so starting out, honorable mention kind of type, I have Matt Morell, Matthew Morell, mm -hmm. Ole Miss. Yeah. Okay. NBA talent could have stayed in the draft. Could have definitely stayed in the draft this year. Comes back to play for Chris Beard at Ole Miss. Um, a little bit inconsistent with the scoring. I mean, what wasn't inconsistent about Ole Miss last year? But this is a 200-pound, 22-year-old who has NBA talent, who's trying to come into his own here under a new coach. He's got the more pieces around him than he did last year. Last year, if you look at the spacing on Ole Miss offensively, I mean, it was – Breakfield could knock down some shots. Amari Abram could knock down some shots. Other than that, it was literally just Matthew Morrell just chucking. So he's going to have more offense around him. I think that's going to help. I think they're going to be better defensively. Um, so I just think – Here's here's what I'll say. Antonio Reeves averaged 14.4 a game, and everyone loves Antonio Reeves. Morrell averaged 14.4 also. You never hear about him. So I just think he's worth he's worth mentioning right up at top. Could he be a top three combo card? I'd say that's his ceiling. Um, but to not mention Morrell as an NBA talent here, I, I think he's got to be mentioned. Yeah, he's so I said I, my my short list has eight guys on it. He's on there. So that was uh, a pretty easy choice for me. And yeah, I'm with you. I think he would be probably towards this kind of range um, in doing it, because as we'll see, there's there's a lot of guys probably ahead of him in terms of production and, right. and those kind of things. But if you just look at the numbers, as you mentioned, I mean, average 14.4 points per game last season. No, he had a little injury situation. I can't remember exactly what the time frame was last season, but oh, um, injury in late January. Yeah, that's it. And you know, too, if you look at the percentages, you know, the percentages were not high, but that also came, I think, one of the reasons for that is what you just said, is because they weren't a great offensive team. And at times, it became very clear, I think, for opposing teams to realize if you can slow down Matthew Morrell, um, there's not a lot of consistent options, I think, offensively for that Ole Miss team. So I think that was part of it is just, you know, he saw a lot of, I mean, in most games, which we could go back and do it, it's like, he probably saw the best defender on the other team um, or second best defender. Right. So it's, that was usually the case I feel like with him. And so, um, yeah, I, I'm very excited just to kind of see how he meshes with this group. Like we talked about Ole Miss, we're very high on them. 
They got a lot of good players coming in. And I think just with the roster that they have, Chris Beard there. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think they're, there's a lot of excitement for what he could do after deciding to come back. So I, I'm with you. I think he's got to be on this list somewhere. So, no, I've got a little sneaky, sneaky pick here. Not, not ranking them, not ranking them here. But okay. for Ole Miss, I took a deep dive into these combo guards. I went deep in the rosters and I was trying to find that. We were talking about it right before the show. I was trying to find that like Alex Caravan. I know he's not a combo guard, but that like red shirt, that freshman that's been there for a year with the program already that, was a good recruit, you know, like when the team landed him, the fans were excited, but since he's just, you know, you've gone through a season and you haven't heard his name mentioned, he kind of falls down the the talk a little bit. And that's Robert Coward for Ole Miss, 6'4", 200 pounds. And now he had to lose weight to get down to 200 pounds. This is a big guard. He's got a strong body. Ole Miss beat out a lot of good schools from beat out Baylor, Xavier, Clemson, Mississippi State. This guy had a lot of good offers, um, can shoot the rock. So if you see Robert Coward, you know, I don't know, 15 minutes a game, knocking down a few threes, add some spacing for Ole Miss, and you're like, where the heck did this guy come from? He was a good recruit in high school, and he just he's had, he's had a year to redshirt. So a little sneaky pick there for me. Yeah, I mean, look, there's going to be guys like that. We see it every year, guys, just kind of come out of you – know, and I think always, too, right, with a coaching change, it's, um, you know, sometimes you just get some of those guys where it's like, Maybe guys before, you're like, well, you didn't really know what their role was going to be, but then all of a sudden they become, you know, someone that really pops with the new coaching staff. And, you know, so that can really change things. So, there, yeah, there, there are going to be guys like that, you know, out there. And, um, yeah, we'll see if, if that's one is one on the mix. All right, you had seven now on to number six. Uh, six. On your list here. here we go. Might get a little bit of slack for this one for not having <laughs> them higher, but never. I have I have Tyron Lawrence here mm. at, at number six, and that's – I, I know some people are going to have him much higher, but this guy had a lot of scoring in, inconsistency last year. This is I, I view Lawrence similar as I view Riley Kugel, someone that is poised for an amazing season who had a great finish to the season, a great finish. Kugel had a great finish. Lawrence, great finish, averaged in the high teens. You can look at that translating straight into this year. Could Tyron Lawrence average high teens, 17.5 a game? Yeah, definitely. But he also had a lot of games where he just completely disappeared. I mean, you look at his game log last year, down the stretch, very good. Um, but in conference play, four points in 30 minutes at Florida, it, two points in 20 minutes at Texas A&M, five points against Tennessee. So it's like next year, if Tyron Lawrence puts up five points at Tennessee, Vanderbilt is not winning that game. So he's going to have a lot more weight on his shoulders. I think there's going to be more expectation. Can he thrive? 100%. Could totally see him averaging 17.5 a game and just being an absolute stud. But I could also see him only averaging, you know, 12.5, 13 and being like, oh, we thought he was going to be a little bit more. It's just playing devil's advocate. I do have him in, you know, top seven combo guards in the, in the conference, but – I think we just got to park the brakes a little bit after looking deeper into Lawrence than we have, you know, been talking this whole off season. What do you, what do you think? Well, so here's the thing with him. And and I think it's, if you're, if you're doing a ranking, right, if you're the sixth best combo guard in the sec, you're still really good. Okay. And so I think that's, that's yeah. worth noting. Right. So it's not like, you know, we're doing it because we're trying to, all right, let's figure out exactly who needs to be in these spots. But right. if you're the sixth best combo guard in our minds or, or whatever, like, you're still really good and you've yeah. got NBA potential. Um, but I think what's interesting is the guys in front of him, which I have a pretty good idea of who those guys are going to be um, because I have him on my list too. Um, he's key he would again, probably be in this range, but there are probably five other guys I'm looking at right now on my list ahead of him that have done it over multiple seasons. Yes. And I think that's where, and look, you're not uh, knocking the guy for that. It's just, he took a big jump to go from playing in 34 games, starting uh, 13 games, I guess, in 21-22, to doubling his minutes to 29 minutes a game last year. He averaged 3.8 points per game that season before, averages 13.1 last season. So he takes a huge jump. And now, as we said, for Vanderbilt, if they're going to be a team that can make the NCAA tournament, it's going to be on the shoulders of Tyron Lawrence and Ezra Manion. Like, that's it. Like, they are going to be the guys that are going to lead them there, and they're good enough to do it. Um, so I don't – yeah, if I were you, I like, I don't think I would criticize the pick of putting him here because it's like – He's still really good. It's just right. that if you're doing a ranking, sure, like you can make the argument that there are maybe five other guys ahead of him, 
that have done it over the course of two or three seasons to this point. And if you're just ranking them, then, you know, you kind of have to pick and choose what you're going to value in one place or the other. But that doesn't mean that, you know, he's being, um, you know, whatever, like it doesn't like he's still a really good player. And guess what? If we'd have done this list a year before, before last season, he wouldn't have been anywhere near the list. Right. right. But now here he is as the number six. So he's made a huge jump. And like you said, you can absolutely see a situation where he winds up in that top three, whatever this season, if, you know, Vanderbilt makes that, that jump, because if they're going to, it's going to be on those two guys to do it. So. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of going to be like a pressure makes diamond situation. If they, they're going to have the ball in their hands, every possession, they can either yeah. thrive or it's going to, you know, maybe a little bit more turnover prone, stuff like that. I mean, we'll see, we'll see. It could go one of two I mean, ways look, or you could yeah. know, be much of the same, be a, be a 13 point per game guy and be solid. I mean, look, both those two guys are ranked in the top six of our point right. guard and combo guard rankings, right. right? So their backcourt, which I'm looking at it here. I mean, there's going to be, I mean, there's really only going to be probably, I think, two other backcourts that have multiple right. guys probably in the top six for us. And we'll get to those teams in a second. But yeah, so so there you go. I mean, that is Vanderbilt is going to have one of the best backcourts in the SEC period. Um, and we'll see again how far that can take them. So, all right, number five. Hard to all right, let's jump up. Here we go. Here we go. All right. So now these top five, you, I could see an argument almost any which way, but I think there's a clear, I think there's a little bit of a separation at the top. Number five and number four, I had a hard time separating. Um, so I'm going to kind of group them together and take the easy way out. Tyree Stratford. <sighs> We've been uh, we've been doing quite a few shows this off season. We've gotten to know each other pretty well. Yes, <laughs> Boot Bradford at number five. Um, that's where I'd have him. Bradford. So that was that's why I guessed it. I, that's where I have him on my list. So. Okay, there you go. I like him. I like him a lot. Um, I almost think he doesn't get enough credit. Kind of overshadowed by Wade Taylor. Um, Bradford is is good. And guess what? I did uh, a few days ago. I went through every SEC team and I did the average age trying to see who's going to have a little bit of an experience age, edge, experience edge, excuse me. Bradford's going to be 24 years old this year, and he's an old 24-year-old, April of 99. So yeah. you, get, you get down to the later parts of the season, this is pretty much a 25-year-old grown adult out there. Radford is going to be very good, gets the free throw line, knocks down threes, defends. I don't know what knock he can have on Tyrese Radford. No. I here's the numbers. If you want to know why Tyrese Rafford is one of the best combo guards in the SEC. And I, I think like you said, I could rank him even higher and I, I yep. may like, I may swap him. Like you said, four and five is probably where I would have a struggle too, because I'm curious to see who that is for you at four and five. I know who I would have in that, that d debate, but here's the numbers on Tyrese Rafford. You talked about the age guy has averaged double figures every single season at Texas A&M every year. He scored in double figures since he's been there four seasons. He's, he's scored in double figures. He has played at least 26 minutes per game every single season at Texas A&M. Three seasons where he's averaged 30 or more minutes a game. He has played in a total of, you're going to get my math skills right here. Oh, boy. Um, 75, 93. Carry uh, the is, one. I, think it's, I think it's 125 games. I'm going to go with that right now. Um, so... I mean, if you really think about that, like this guy has played a ton of basketball at the highest level um, and has been a consistent contributor on this team every single season. And so, yes, like there, there are, you know, there are a couple other guys we're going to talk about that have done the same thing, but like, yes, he is. I, I think Chris and I talked about this last year. We may have put him, you know, we did our awards on our most under underrated team at the end of the season. I I'm very certain we had Tyrese Radford on there. Um, I may be wrong about that. Maybe we actually had him on one of our um, all SEC teams. But yeah, I mean he he does not get enough credit. And I think, like you said, maybe just a product of playing a you know alongside Wade Taylor. But that's what makes Texas a makes them so good is having both of those guys. And so I'm right there with you. This guy is a no brainer top five. You can put him at four. You can put him at three. I don't care. I'm not gonna argue with you. Um, because he is absolutely in the top five, and there's there's no debate, in my opinion, about that. Another little nugget on Radford. So Texas A&M loses their leading rebounder in Dexter Dennis. Yeah. That's who was their second leading rebounder in the mm -hmm. SEC. He's been very consistent rebounding throughout his entire career. Again, you want to look at the Like, he's averaged yeah. at least 5.3 rebounds every single season. So he's a great yeah. rebounding guard. Yeah. He's, yeah. So, oh, he's good. 
you can't. Right. I, I love me some some Boots Radford. Now we got to know who you picked ahead of him at number four, because I think I know who it is. So let me see. It's right, one of on. two guys. All right. So my guess is it's either Mark Sears or, yep, or... Antonio Reeves. Yep. Look at this. It just, this is like we've done three shows together. Look at this. Just on the same wavelength. All right. Yep. Well, who, who are you putting it for then? Okay. So at four, you could flip these guys any way you want these two. At four, though, I have Mark Sears. The reason I have Mark Sears and not Antonio Reeves here is just because Reeves looked absolutely unbelievable at Global Jam. I think he really he averaged 14.4. I said that earlier when comparing him to Morrell. I think that goes up. He's going to be in a much yeah. faster paced offense. That dribble drive kick out scheme that Cal's going to be running this year with those quick point guards. Um, you're not going to have the best rebounder in the country to dish out open offensive rebound threes this time. So maybe a few less threes, but I think you just that offense is going to be so fast flying up and down the court. I think his points per game is going to go up, Reeves. So that's why I have him at three. Sears at four, though. I I like Sears more than I liked Jaden Bradley, than I liked Javon Quinnerly. I thought Sears was, was very good in March last year. Um, the only thing with Sears is sometimes he would just disappear and kind of not be too aggressive and, you know, not look for his own shot. He only averaged 2.6 assists per game. Quinterly and Bradley were both above three. So I'm not sure how well Sears is going to do being that primary ball handler. We talked in the point guard video about how Alabama doesn't really have a true point guard. Sears is much better off the ball. Maybe he kind of comes into his own here and we see a new Mark Sears, but at 6-1, he had like almost 10 rebounds against San Diego State. Uh, he's, he's a fighter in there. He's strong. He's going to be older. He's got another year in the SEC. Last year was his first year. You didn't know how he was going to pan out. I I think Sears is is not going to go backwards. I don't think he takes a step back. He had average 12.9 in SEC play last year. So I think you're going to see a nice double-digit score, a nice veteran, veteran guard that, you know, can make some tough baskets in when the – you know, when defense locks down and you're passing it around the the arc and you need someone to break down a 1v1 matchup, give the ball to Sears. He's going to be able to do it. So the common denominator for these two guys for me is, and you, you said it in a different way, but these two guys have a lot of pressure on them this season, like so these two guys specifically, because we just, we talked about it with Alabama, right? And and we, you know, we can talk about, you know, every I know Alabama fans are upset in terms of our rankings and saying, well, we're just not sure about them. And, um, you know, we just we were trying to figure out exactly what the roster will look at, look at yeah. at the time, which we did that in early mid June, something like that. But now that you kind of see it, yes, like there's a lot of pressure on Mark Sears. And that was, you know, I, I think somewhat of a product of Javon Quinterly transferring because we were kind of just sort of pairing them together and saying, all right, these two guys can take some of the, the pressure off of each other as a, a duo that's played games together and, and all that. And now it's kind of a little bit different because you, you know, you have guys coming in, whether it's right cell Estrada, you've got Rylan Griffin, you know, kind of more of a, a wing, but still like, I think you're, you're, you're looking at a situation where, okay, like a lot is on Sears in terms of you're in a NATO offense, you know, what your role is. All the pressure is really on you is kind of the point guy for the offense and how the offense runs, because that's the name of the game. And so, yeah, like there's a lot of pressure on him. On the flip side, Antonio Reeves, you said it. I mean, look how great he looked kind of at, at Global Jam. And and I think a lot of people came out of that saying, all right, we're not as pessimistic about Kentucky as we were. But right. a lot of that is, is still Antonio Reeves, right? Like it's seeing how good he can be and saying, all right, well, a lot of this is going to be on his shoulders. And yes, Kentucky is very talented. We've said that. They could be the most talented team in the league just if you're just looking at talent. But you have a team, as we said, that has two old guys on it, and that's Antonio Reeves and Trey Mitchell. And a lot is on those two guys to carry not just a production standpoint, but it is leadership. It is all those things that come with being the two upperclassmen on the roster, essentially. And that's it. So, yeah, like I, I think that's you know kind of an interesting dynamic if you're you're kind of putting Sears and Reeves in the same category. A lot of that is I'm not saying they're the same player, but if you're that they are kind of close together in terms of the ranking, but they're in a similar situation in that, man. It feels like their season, their team season, 
and I guess we could say this about other guys too, that a couple other guys are on the list. We talked about Tyron Lawrence, maybe some right. being in the same case and, and maybe it's everybody on this list. I don't know, but I think these two specifically, when you think about the expectations, you know, Alabama, you know, number one seed in the NCAA tournament last year, Kentucky wants to get back to being the number one seed in the NCAA tournament. Not to say that Vanderbilt can't, you know, eventually get to, to that kind of level or A&M or any of these other guys we talked about, but yeah, like these two are, are in a very interesting spot. So um yeah it's an interesting dynamic with three and four on the list here so yeah and one thing that's kind of that i wanted to mention that's interesting about alabama that i didn't really know they are the second youngest team in the sec this upcoming year kentucky yeah. has and now these average ages there were some like low level freshmen that i couldn't find their age i just guessed right, based on when they graduated yeah. i just put you know 18 or 19 for them but kentucky's average age is about 19.6 and Alabama's is 20. There, a lot of people are like, you know, just really taken back by how young Kentucky is, and they have a lot of questions based on that. Alabama is almost just as young. And so I'm not knocking Alabama. I'm just saying, like, as far as pressure on the shoulders of these older guys, right on. Sears and, and Reeves are going to have a lot on their shoulders. Um, Let's move up. Top two. All right. Here we go. I know who they are. I just – I don't know what order you're going to put them in. So – I, yeah. I'm fascinated by this because, I, quite frankly, I don't know what order I'd put them in right now. I'd, I'd go back and forth, but I'm, yeah, I'm curious I've to see if you've made the decision here. I've I've tried to separate them. I don't think I you can really. They both play a very similar game for their teams. But number two, I have Debo Davis. And number one, I have Santi Vescovi. So I'm, I'm going to group these two together because I both think they're the two most elite combo guards in the conference. I think it would be a shame to not mention either of these two guys as some of the some of the best in the conference. Um, Devo Davis, the reason I have him at number two and not number one is just based on the fact that Vescovy is going to stuff the stat sheet a little bit more. He's going to put up yeah. he's going to put up more numbers. Um, you look at Vescovy's stat sheet, and it, I'm not saying it looks like uh, it kind of reminds me of like a Luca stat sheet where it's like rebounds and assists are always are always stacked up and he's going to get you double digit points he's going to make a few threes he's not going to turn the ball over that much he's not going to follow that much he's just santi is your your perfect combo guard that you want someone that can play point you saw him do it when zakai went out last year um but he's just solid he's just rock solid he's great defender good leader and this tennessee team's going to be going to be kind of young for tennessee teams they they have a lot of freshmen coming in um so yeah, that's why I have Vescovy at number one and not number two, just because he's just so well-rounded. And there's going to be some games where Debo maybe a little bit lackadaisical, not lackadaisical, but just doesn't put up enough, you know, points to be like 20 points a game, you know, type of guy. He's going to be more like around 10 to 12. But the one thing I love about Devo Davis that I don't know if Santiago Vescovy has this trait is like that bucket getter trait. And you saw it with Davis against Kansas. You know, when you are down and it's, it's you know, it's coming towards February, coming towards March, where defenses are really going to lock down, you're playing at an opponent's, you know, you're playing away from home and you need a basket. I have full confidence if you swing that ball around the arc and you get it to Devo Davis, he's going to find a shot. Now, Vescovy, if the three's there, he's going to take it, might pump, try to find something. He's just not as dynamic one-on-one -on -one as Devo is. So they have a little bit of a different game, but I mean, how can you go wrong with either of these guys? I mean, no. what you can you knock on them for anything? No, I mean, look, it's we've talked about both these guys, and we've gushed over our our love for for both of these guys. And you talked about if you just look at the stats, right? Vescovy um, averaged twelve point five points per game last season. Devo averaged eleven, basically. Um, yeah. Turnovers one and a half to two point one in favor of Vescovy steals uh 1.8 to 1.4 in favor of vescovy and, and i'm just i'm showing you not just who's winning these categories i'm showing you how close they are like right. in all these categories right uh rebounds vescovy 4.6 davis 4.4 um free throw percentage 77.5 percent 71.9 percent so five percentages basically on that three point percentage vescovy shot 37 percent devo shot 35 percent um minutes yeah. two of the highest minutes getters in the sec maybe the i don't remember exactly how many some of these guys played but I would have to believe these are two of the probably top five, seven guys, probably higher than maybe top three in terms of minutes because Vescovy played 32.9, Devo played 33.1. So 
Um, yeah, I mean, look, there's in terms of the guard position, they are in the top five in the SEC in terms of value to their team. And quite frankly, I think you can make the case that you could even say for the entire group, perhaps one through five, like at position. I mean, these these are two of the most valuable players in the SEC, period, um, just to what their team does. And it's for different reasons, because Vescovy, what he brings for Tennessee, as you said, pretty much everywhere. But I think for Devo, he does the same thing. But it's kind of we talk like it's almost like we've we've called Devo like he's sort of Mr. SEC. And you mentioned it like he's just the, yeah. the, the clutch guy that yeah. anyone would want to have on their team. Not to say that no one would want these other guys, but like he is just like he's Mr. Arkansas. Right. And, and he is kind of he embodies what Arkansas has become from a basketball standpoint, what Eric Musselman has done there to get them to the NCAA tournament, not just doing that regularly, but getting them to the second weekend of the tournament year after year after year. He is kind of what embodies that. Like he brings all of those attributes that have helped him get to that point. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think essentially, you know, if we were going to do a cop out answer, yeah, like these guys are one A and one B. Yeah. And then I think, you know, you're kind of picking and choosing who you want to put behind them. But I think they are clearly one A and one B um, in whatever order you want to put them in. I know Arkansas fans will put Devo there. Tennessee fans will put Vescovy. I'm not going to argue with either way. Um, yeah. But yeah, like that's, that's what, that's how good these two guys are. And I think if you're, you know, again, you can rank them for different reasons, but just in terms of value at any position in the SEC, not just combo guard, these are two of the most valuable players in the SEC for maybe not just the stuff they do from a stat perspective, which they both, as you said, they sort of fill the stat sheet quite a bit, but they also bring those things outside of it, you know, as the older guys, uh, the, you know, the leadership stuff and, and all the other things kind of just keep hold everything together for what their team wants to do. So, yeah, I mean, there's these two guys are like we talked about. They're just man, they're, they're so good. And then they're they are just where's the let me try to find the word. They are just tremendous, like college basketball players. Yeah. Like if you're just talking from a college basketball, what is college basketball about? Like you would put two of these guys right there in the conversation in terms of if you wanted to explain it to someone. So there you go. Yeah. I remember, I think <laughs> last weekend, me and my roommate, we rewatched Villanova, North Carolina national championship game. Mm. And in that game, the guard play was just like, it was like, man, what I would do for an Archie Diacono, man, what I would do for a Marcus page. And it's like, that's what she, that's kind of reminds me of what Davis and Vescovy are for their teams. Like an old guy, they're open, they're going to bang a three. If not, they can, you know, facilitate for others. They're going to defend. They're going to rebound. They're going to do a little bit of everything. And it's like you watch those teams that make these runs into March, and you're like, well, man, they've got really good older guards. That's exactly yeah. what these two teams have. Now, I I told you a, I told you a little sneaky guy I had earlier, Robert <laughs> Coward for Ole Miss. I got another one out of Tennessee, and that is – I'm going to butcher the last name. Definitely going to butcher it, but it's – Freddie Dillion, Freddie Dillioni. I don't know how you say that. D I L I. Got to be one of the two. Yeah, but I'm gonna say Dillion. Um, red, another redshirt freshman here. So I went the I went the redshirt freshman route to find my sneaky guys here. Uh, Dillion is 6'5", 180. He's long. He's really good. Um, I was looking through old reporters' takes of of Freddie Dillion back when he was a senior in high school. Listen to Jeff Borzello, what he said about him literally almost a, a year ago today. It was August 16th, so I, like two weeks off of a year. He goes, Dillion was one of the best scorers I saw all of July. Scores it from all three levels. What does Tennessee need? <laughs> yeah. Scoring at all three levels. So, I mean, they've got a lot of – they brought in a lot of good guys. So did almost every other team in the SEC brought in a lot of good guys. We probably didn't mention – a ton of amazing, amazing. Well, let's, let's bring up, like, let's just talk about a couple guys quickly. Like, and I'm yeah. just going to give you, here's what I'm going to do. Like, I'm going to give you, like, I'm going to go down your list here and I'm just going to grab some names. And if grab there's some names. Some, some, somebody you want to talk about in that group, we will, but here's, here's who I would say probably leads the pack in terms of if you're just trying to put together a group that maybe is right behind this group. Right. Behind, um, yes, like this. You know, so Alabama, right. Sell Estrada. We don't, I mean, I think, you know, again, one of those guys probably pops, right? If you're going to use that for like, they're playing at Alabama, they're a guard, a combo guard, they're going to play minutes and they're going to get their opportunity. So wouldn't be surprised. Let's talk about like Layden Blocker real quick. Cause I know people, right. we didn't mention him in the point guard video, but we do have him in this category on our sheet. And Max, I know you can talk about him in a second. 
Um, you know, so we we have him on the sheet. Khalid Battle is another one we know is coming over. Denver Jones, I think, is an interesting one. Yes. Um, you know, at Auburn, I think for me, he would probably be right there in terms of the conversation. And he's one of the older guys too. Um, I'm trying to look down here, and again, I'm not going to mention everybody. I'm just going to give you a little bit to work with here. Um, Trey Fort, someone. I mean, I know you mentioned him on Twitter. We've kind of we've kind of yep. talked about him in the text. Um, he's an interesting um, choice at Mississippi State. I think he's under the radar. Probably for most people, um, you know, I talked about Talon Cooper when he came to South Carolina. I don't know how South Carolina's how good they're going to be this season, but I do think he's someone that um, will kind of have to carry them. Uh, and then everyone else, I mean, that that's probably what I'm looking at in terms of you just want to put some names to discuss. Um, again, there's yeah. going to be some that we don't mention. Maybe Zion pulling too at Florida, but um, go with that wherever you want in terms of just kind of our maybe you even put them in the, the honorable mention category. Yeah, let's just do a, a quick rundown. Um, Right cell Estrada, you think you nailed it. One of them's got to pop. I don't think both of them are going to pop, but one of them's got to. And if one of them does, Kentucky backcourt – or Kentucky, Alabama backcourt uh, is looking looking decent. Um, I don't think both of them are going to pop, though. One's coming from Fullerton. One's coming from Hofstra. He did very well at Hofstra, did Estrada, but we saw him at the, the Power 5 level before at Oregon. He couldn't touch the floor. So I don't know what to expect. I hope we see – Hofstra, Estrada, just for the sake of the SEC. Excited for the for the Alabama backcourt. Um, Crosby's a, a, a freshman there also. Uh, Cosby, I think. Davin Cosby. I've uh, been seeing Alabama's strength and conditioning uh, updates, and he looks – he put on like 15, 20 pounds. He looks good. So I think someone out of that Alabama backcourt that we're not talking about is definitely going to pop. Um, Arkansas. Yeah, we didn't mention Layden Blocker. I have more of a combo guard. You can say he's a point guard. I think that's what he's listed as. Um, but he's not your average freshman. He's big. He's lengthy. Um, he's going to be a really good defender, and that's what I think Moss likes about him. Um, I posted a clip uh, a few weeks ago of him dunking on Bronny James. Um, not to any knock on Bronny James. He's a good defender, but Layden Blocker can can play. This kid is definitely going to find his way on the court. Um, Battle, the only thing I want to say about Khalif Battle is people tend to – there's a – I don't know how true it is. I don't know the extent of it, but people tend to hear Khalif battle and just dismiss him as a locker room kind of nuisance, you know, kind of teammate issue. This guy's 23 years old. He just averaged 17 points a game and led his team in assists. Must knows what he's doing here. Okay. I, I think, I think we, we had, we should have some serious expectation on Khalif battle and not just to dismiss him as a locker room issue. Um, Denver Jones. I think you, you nailed it. He's, he's right on the edge of this. Um, another 23-year-old that comes in. We mentioned it before. The SEC brought in this position group. They brought in talent here. They brought in old guys. It's not just a bunch of freshmen coming in. Um, so, yeah, if Denver. but if Denver Jones doesn't hit for Auburn, I mean, what are we looking like there at Auburn? You know, it's going to be KD Johnson, maybe some Trey Donaldson. I think there's a. you were talking about a lot of pressure on uh, Antonio Reeves and Mark Sears. I think there's a lot of pressure on Denver Jones coming in. Yeah. So no, I think so. Yeah. I think there's a lot of pressure on Jones. Um, Zion Pollen, Florida. He's going to be good, but I was looking at his his full his full college career, and he's really not that great of a shooter. Um, last year, his overall percentage was in the high 30s, but in conference, I think he was like 29. Last year, he was either in the high 20s or really low 30s. So. I think he's definitely going to come off the bench. I don't think he, he starts over Clayton, Kugel, Richard. Um, but still, 18 points per game off the bench is, is a nice addition. Um, and then my guy, I wanted, to, I wanted to mention him. I'm glad you mentioned him. I didn't think you were going to mention him, but that's Trey Fort. No. And he, uh, I think in their last game of their, uh, their overseas trip, he was like second on the team in scoring or something like that. But – the main thing with, with Trey Fort is he's 46% from three over two years. And it's, it's very high volume. He was like, he was like an L Ellis type of volume. He was the guy on that team. Um, so Mississippi state, we, we harped on him all year for, for lack of three point shooting. So he's a, he's a guy that could add some shooting. We didn't mention uh, any of Missouri's um, guards coming in. Yeah. We forgot to mention those guys. Um, Sean East, obviously um, very old. I think he's going to be turning 24 this year. Um, he just can't really shoot, can't really space the floor, but he's great defensively, a great floor general to have. And then no one, absolutely no one is talking about Caleb Grill. Um, Caleb Grill's 
started for Iowa State in the in Big Big Twelve. Um, in the Big Twelve, everyone knows how good the Big Twelve was last year. Um, Caleb Grills, like he's a good perimeter defender and he can knock down threes. I think he had like that thirty point game against UNC early on in the season or some. Um, but yeah, so no one's talking about Caleb Grill. It's definitely worth mentioning. Um, but yeah, I mean, looking down the list, one more guy I wanted to mention was Cameron Carr coming into Tennessee, freshman, another good shooter. Um, this is going to be a new look Tennessee team. I really, I really think so. There was some turnover with their assistant coaches. They brought in a lot more offensive minded players, Dalton connect, great score. I think this is going to be not so stuck in the mud, Tennessee. I think we're going to see a new look Tennessee and I'm excited for it. What do you think? You got any other guys you want to mention? I mean, look, as we always say, there's going to be someone that we're like, oh yeah, we forgot to mention them after the fact, but Noah Thomason, Noah Thomas, there you go. At Georgia. There yeah. You go. There we go. Um, yeah. So, I mean, like we said, we, we, we probably mentioned more combo guards than, than anyone out there um, in, in covering SEC. We probably basketball still this missed season. Some. So, and we probably still missed a couple guys that we thought we probably said, but then we're going to realize, oh yeah, we forgot to mention that guy. So um, yeah. So, I mean, there's, again, th there's a lot of good guards in this league and it's going to be interesting to see kind of which of these guys I'm glad we, we did, you know, but you brought up Layden Blocker. I think he's easily one of the candidates depending on what, you know, how big his role is initially, which I think we, you know, sort of expect him to be a key part of that team. I think he could easily jump into this, this list. And, um, you know, there, there are others as well. I mean, Thomason, depending on how good he is at Georgia, he would, ex you would expect to be one of the kind of the leaders on that team uh, from a production standpoint. And, and any of the Missouri guys, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I thought we'd mentioned that group earlier. We did not. But yes, I mean that's any of those guys. I think you could see a Tamar Bates, Caleb Grill, yep, like you said, Bates. Sean East, take a big step. So yeah, I mean there's again we just probably named off thirty something players, and so um, and we probably forgot number thirty one. But yeah. that's I what mean, we do here at position. Southeastern fourteen. <laughs> this this, this <laughs> position group in this conference. No, I, I mean come on. Look, get it gets much it gets much easier when we start to get into the forwards in the center yeah, because yeah. you have a pretty clearly defined group there um right. you know and i think this is just much harder when you're talking about guards because as we said it's just you got some guys true point guards some guys in that more combo guard role but a lot of good guards in the sec but we will have it all covered as usual here max uh, we'll continue our stroll through our position rankings in the sec here in the off season i'm sure what's next we're gonna have wings probably you know small forward type Yep. Probably the next on our, our list. So we're under a hundred days till the start of the season. Yeah. We're, so we're, we're not that far away. And so, which means we will have a lot more basketball stuff here coming. Of course, it's almost the start of football season. You guys, if you subscribe, you know that uh, we've been pumping out uh, a ton of football stuff. Every team previewed, we're already doing our predictions for week one. So you can find all those there uh, as well. Daily SEC football videos, and we'll start to have more frequent sec basketball videos as well as we finish this series and we'll start to probably here pretty soon get into our official team previews for the upcoming uh basketball season and start to look at those a little little ways out because we finally finally knock on wood max because there could be transfers still oh, i mean it, i mean that's the thing right we, we could preview a team tomorrow and they could probably still lose that player for the transfer in like october somehow so um yeah so just keep that in mind we'll have it all covered here at southeastern 14 hit that subscribe button it always helps us out hit the like button as well and uh again for max Barr and blake Lovell, we appreciate you guys uh supporting our sec basketball off-season coverage here and uh, we will talk to you again here soon at southeastern 14.